Okay, hi there. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. Let me make a couple of logistical comments. So people have been asking all kinds of questions, which I find really fun. Um, hopefully people have been finding the answers interesting. Uh, we've decided to kind of separate uh, several different streams of this. So I'll be doing the Science and Technology Q&A weekly. Um, I also, for uh, other people with other interests, we're going to do a business and innovation Q&A, um, more for grown-ups, so to speak. Um, uh, and that will be every other week. And then in the intervening weeks, we'll be doing a, a history of science and technology Q&A. And then I will be doing monthly, uh, probably a physics project Q&A, which will be suitable for much more technical questions about physics. Um, and we have one of those coming up in about a week. So that's some um, for this, uh, for this live stream, I'm really hope to concentrate on all kinds of science and technology and explaining things and so on. Um, probably not so much on the, um, I'm happy to talk about some life and times kinds of things, but uh, not so much on the kind of more business-like uh, uh, end of things. All right, so let's see. We have a few questions saved up here. Uh, there's one that, that sort of violates my principle about not talking about details, but from David, uh, have I discussed the physics project with any string theorists? Oh yes, lots of string theorists. Um, and uh, uh, in fact, we, uh, we have right now our uh, uh, winter school for our physics project. Uh, so uh, we, we limited that to 20 people, all physicists um, at various stages of, uh, of education and so on. And a number of those people actually are string theorists, but, but I've also uh, talked to a good fraction of the world's kind of leading string theory operatives about our project. And I think everybody kind of agrees that, that um, uh, you know, we need to figure out the kind of mathematical physics links between, between our project and string theory. Maybe I can, um, uh, for people's benefit, I'm not seeing um, uh, any questions here. So I'll, I'll, um, I could talk about what string theory is and um, uh, I could talk about, um, let's see. Um, okay. Um, well, we got a bunch of different questions here. I'm, I'm a little bit confused by what I'm seeing. Um, and, uh, um, all right, let's see. Um, Well, all right, shall we, um, um, there's a question here about clouds, which I'm pretty sure I answered a couple of weeks ago. Um, the, okay, well, let, let's talk about, um, um, okay, here's a question from Mitchell, uh, asking about the possibility of building an unmanned spacecraft to hitch a ride on a comet to reach and, and perhaps launch the spacecraft out of the solar system. All right, that's a fun one. Let's, um, let's talk about that. Uh, so first question is, uh, what are comets? So people, uh, th that was one of the achievements of uh, Newton, Isaac Newton back in the 16, late 1600s, was figuring out that comets are sort of just like planets. Planets have orbits around the sun that are really close to circles. Um, the, uh, the sun is at the center, planet orbits around. What's happening is the force of gravity is, uh, is holding the planet in towards the sun and the force that the kind of centrifugal force, you know, like when you twirl something around uh, with your hand, there'll, there'll be a force that's sort of pulling the thing away from, away from you and you're, 
you know, if you have a string or something, the string is pulling the thing back towards you. In the case of a planet, what's happening is that same kind of force that's, that's associated with the, the planet. Yeah, here, here's a way to say it. If there were no forces acting on the planet, the planet, if you make it go in a certain direction, it will just keep going in a straight line. In order to get the planet, uh, the planet doesn't do that because there's a force associated with gravity pulling the planet towards the sun. And so, but there's a, effectively a force that is trying to make the planet uh, go off and get, get out of its orbit because the planet really just wants to keep going in a straight line. In order to keep it going in its orbit, you have to be continually pulling it with the force of gravity towards the sun. So the, the most obvious way to have that set up is to have the force of gravity uh, pull you towards the, the sun at the center and you're just going around in a circular orbit. But the thing that was figured out by, by Newton and friends is that you can also have orbits where um, you have the, the, the sun, where, where the orbit is actually an ellipse and where the sun is at one focus of an ellipse. So an ellipse is an elongated circle. You know, if you just take a circle and let's say you're, you're in a, 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 you know, a, a, a drawing program, you just pull it out in the, in the horizontal direction, you squash it down in the vertical direction, you'll get, uh, you start off with a circle, you, you squash it in the vertical direction, you pull it in the horizontal direction, you will then get an ellipse. An ellipse is just a transformed circle. But um, one way that you can draw an ellipse, well, first to draw a circle, you can just put uh, something at the center and you have a little a piece of string or a, or a, or a, um, a compass and you, the piece of string is a fixed length and you just keep going around the thing at the center uh, in a circle, just uh, always keeping it a fixed length from, from, that, uh, from that thing at the center. To draw an ellipse, you can do the same kind of thing, but instead of having a single center, you have two centers, you have two foci, foci of the ellipse. And then you have a piece of string which goes from one uh, foci of focus of the ellipse to your pencil to the other focus of the ellipse. So that means, and, and then you move your pencil around, um, always keeping, and so what, what that's doing is it's keeping the, the, uh, the, the total distance from those two foci the same because the, the, you have the same piece of string which has the same total length, but the proportion of length going from the first focus to the pencil um, uh, is, is, is different as you move the pencil around. And so if you, if you do that, you get, instead of getting a circle that you get with a single point at the center, by, by having this thing with two points, you end up getting an ellipse. So then the thing that Newton discovered is that the, the, the sun, that, that you can have an orbit of, 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 a, of, of something around the sun where the sun is at one focus of an ellipse. And then the, the, um, the, the orbit can go around um, like that. And I'm just thinking, how do you, is there an elementary way to prove that result? Uh, should be. Um, well, never mind. Anyway, that, that's some, so a comet tends to be a thing in our solar system that has a very eccentric orbit. It has an orbit that isn't close to a circle, that instead is like an ellipse where, where uh, the comet, uh, you know, for w w comet can be for a while very close to the sun and then it can go very far out uh, from the sun. Maybe uh, we, the earth orbits by definition at roughly one astronomical unit from the sun, but a comet might go 200 astronomical units out or more um, and then come back in towards the sun. Um, so there are a variety of kind of places where comets hang out or come from in our solar system, um, both um, uh, close in at the asteroid belt and further out at the Oort cloud and things that are far be beyond uh, the planets that we normally identify. Um, and so, you know, comets are typically these quite small objects. They're often made of, uh, they often have lots of ice um, on them. And uh, what happens, the, the reason comets are kind of really notable in the, when you see them in the sky is that they have tails. Um, and uh, so the question is, what is the tail of a comet? Tail of a comet is uh, what, uh, there's a, there's a uh, from the sun, in addition to light coming from the sun, uh, there's also a, a solar wind, a stream of particles that come out from the sun that are 
uh, that, that stream outwards from the sun. And um, that uh, when, when, when there's a comet that's being heated by this, as the comet comes in towards the sun, let's say the comet is made of ice, the comet will be heated as it gets towards the sun and that will cause the ice to uh, actually in, in at, um, at low pressures, like in the vacuum of space, ice, we're used to ice when you heat it up, just turning into liquid water. And then if you heat it up more, it will turn into steam. But in the low pressure of space, uh, ice goes straight from being in its solid phase to being uh, uh, gaseous, to, to being steam. And so what's, what's happening is you can get, um, you get, uh, uh, it, it's heated as the, as the comet comes in towards the sun, it gets heated up and some of the ice will, will sublimate, will turn into, uh, into steam effectively. And then because of the solar wind from the sun, the, um, uh, that will tend to make the, um, uh, the, the, the direction of the, of the particles of, of the water molecules and so on be away from the sun. So when, when you look at a comet, you'll see the tail of the comet is always pointing away from the sun. Um, and that, uh, uh, so that's sort of a, a thing that makes a comet noticeable is, is that it will have, uh, have this kind of tail behind it. Um, okay, so the question then is, uh, can you, for example, um, uh, uh, can you send a spacecraft to a comet? Well, a couple of spacecraft have been sent to comets. I think there was some um, Japanese spacecraft was the first one, I think, a European one. Um, I think there may be, I'm, I'm losing track of my deep space missions. I'm not sure if there's been an American one yet. I think there's one planned. Um, uh, but anyway, you can, you can send spacecraft to comets um, and uh, the, there's an attempt to actually retrieve material from a comet. Um, the, uh, uh, the thing that um, is a little weird, comets are very small. And so the gravity of a comet is very, uh, you know, it, if you land on, on the moon or on Mars, there'll be a decent amount of gravity. On the moon, it's about one sixth the gravity of Earth. So, you know, if you see people, astronauts walking on the moon, you'll see that they take very big steps because with the force that they can exert with their legs to walk, that, um, uh, that same force will propel them up much further, six times further. Well, the, the height is is uh, square root of that. No, no, the height will be will be proportional to that. Um, so is that right? Well, anyway, the the when the gravity is smaller, the 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 same force sort of uh, pushing one up as one walks will make one take a much bigger sort of jumping walk. So on the moon, the gravity is one sixth the gravity of the Earth. On a comet. Uh, because the comet is much, much smaller, the gravity will be much, much, much smaller. So even if you have landed on the comet, the slightest mistake and, you, you know, the slightest kind of uh, thing that's pushing you down towards the comet, you'll find that you just get, you, you get pushed away from the comet and you'll escape from the comet. Like on the Earth, you have to be going at 25,000 miles an hour uh, to escape the gravity of the Earth. On a comet, you might have to go at, you know, just, you know, one mile an hour or less to escape the gravity of the comet and to be sort of uh, floating off into space. But so a question, I think the question that was asked is, could one sort of hop on a comet and then ride it out to the outer solar system? I would think that would work. I don't know why that wouldn't work. Um, the, uh, you know, things get difficult um, if you're, um, uh, you know, I think the, the problem of, of sort of attaching yourself to a comet and, and not falling off, I'm sure if you, you, you know, you have to sort of grab it with claws in some way so that you don't fall off um, if, uh, if there's any other, uh, if, if anything is pushing you away from the surface. Um, I think there's, there's also plenty of issues um, uh, as you go far from the sun, the, the way most spacecraft like in Earth orbit get their power is essentially all spacecraft in Earth orbit get their power from solar power, uh, from photovoltaic cells, which take the light from the sun and convert it into electricity, just like solar panels on a house or a, a electrical uh, 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 supply utility that's using solar power. When you go to the outer solar system, the, um, uh, the power, the, the, uh, the, 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 the intensity of the sun has fallen off to the point where the sun is just this tiny dot in the sky and there's very little intensity of light 
that falls on spacecraft. And so it uh, becomes quite unrealistic to power the spacecraft using solar power when you get out uh, far out uh, from the sun. And so the most common uh, way of powering spacecraft that go out uh, that far is with, um, uh, uh, with radioactivity, um, not a nuclear reactor where a nuclear, in a nuclear reactor, you're, um, uh, you're, you're using the fact that, well, so in, in what, what does it mean to, to, okay, how does radioactivity work at this level? The, the, I will explain that, that um, uh, you're, the way it works in a nuclear battery, common name for, for these kinds of things, is different from the way a nuclear power station or a, a nuclear explosion works. Um, but in a, in a nuclear battery, the idea is that you have a material that is radioactive. That basically means that the nuclei of the atoms are just self-destructing at some rate. And that happens um, as a result of uh, the, 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 it happens sort of randomly for each atom. That's a result of kind of quantum mechanics, sort of basic ideas of physics, that there will be a certain for a particular radioactive uh, uh, element, radioactive isotope, the isotope is just the configuration of the nucleus of an atom. So for a particular uh, radioactive isotope, there will be a certain characteristic half-life, which means what's the, uh, what's the average amount of time if you have uh, you know, a thousand uh, nuclei of that type, what's the average amount of time before 500 of them will have decayed? So different nuclei that are unstable have different uh, half-lives. And when the nucleus decays, the, the, you, know, you start off with just this nucleus and then it, it, uh, uh, it decays and, and a piece of the nucleus will essentially fall off or the nucleus will break in two. Um, and the pieces, the, the, when that happens, a fair amount of energy is released. Essentially the, 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 the pieces that come out from the nucleus will be, uh, the, the, they, they will turn uh, energy that used to be used in binding the nucleus together they'll turn that energy into energy of motion of the, of the things that come out of the decayed nucleus. And so the idea of these sort of nuclear batteries uh, tends to be to, to take a, a radioactive element and um, uh, let it decay. And then those decay products will be going fast and those decay products will heat something up. And then you use the heat that's produced from those decay products um, to, uh, uh, to, to make electricity um, that you can use to power the spacecraft. And there's been a certain, um, uh, there's, a, there's a whole sort of story of being able to get the right kind of um, uh, nuclear isotopes to be able to put in spacecraft. And people have had a hard time, actually, I think in the, one of the Jupiter missions, um, they, they use some of the sort of stockpile of, of a US stockpile of, of reactive materials. Um, and there was uh, sort of, a, it's, it's been hard to get that stuff because in the world at large, um, it's it's uh, it, uh, people don't want to make available these these large amounts of radioactive material because you can use them to make bombs and things like this, um, and so that's it tends to be a thing where there hasn't been so much of that produced, um, which makes it hard to to provide the material for spacecraft. But anyway, the the, the, the sort of the answer, I, I think it's it's perfectly realistic to imagine sort of attaching something to a comet and having it uh, go off to the outer solar system, how you keep it powered and how you keep it transmitting uh, radio signals back to the earth um, is you know, a challenge of engineering. I mean, I think the, the most cool thing to do would be to hitch a ride on an interstellar comet. Um, there was so far only, I think one has been observed with a strange name, it was named uh, Uma Numa, I think. I think I'm saying that correctly. This was something observed about two years ago. Uh, there was a, um, uh, a thing that looked like kind of a comet, asteroid, you know, uh, some body in the solar system. And it was tracked with telescopes. And it was found that if you, if you plotted its orbit, it could not be orbiting around the sun. It was moving kind of, uh, uh, it was moving in such a way that it just wasn't, uh, wasn't, part of something that was orbiting around the sun. So that means that it was a, a piece of rock basically that was uh, coming from out of the solar system um, and just happened to be passing through the solar system. And, and people think that actually there's a decent number of these interstellar comets or whatever that will pass through the solar system. But this particular one 
you know, a, a cool thing to be able to do if, if one had one's act together quickly enough and, and one would have to be, uh, I, I think it would be a challenge to get there quickly enough is go hitch a ride on this thing that is uh, tooling out of the solar system um, and, uh, uh, you know, go, go use that to, um, uh, um, uh, to uh, yeah, to, 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 to explore further. You know, I'm, I'm realizing there's a bit of a problem with what we're saying here, because in order to land on a comet, you have to kind of match the speed of the comet. But by the time you're matching the speed of the comet, you will be going in the same orbit as the comet. So in a sense, it's not clear what the advantage of sort of hitching the ride is, because by the time you're, by the time, if you want to land on a comet, you better be matching the speed of the comet. If you, if you are crashing into the comet at 20,000 miles an hour, um, well, it's, it's very challenging to survive that. Um, but uh, so by the time you're matching the speed of the comet, um, just by sort of the laws of mechanics, um, you will have, uh, it, 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 if you have two things in orbit, one of them is, has a, a, a large mass, one of them has a small mass, they will still have the same orbit. Um, so, so if you manage to match the speed of the comet, you will follow the same orbit as the comet. So I, I'm actually reversing myself here a bit and saying that, that um, uh, I'm not sure there's a point in hitching a ride, so to speak. I think once you can match the speed of the thing, you're going to follow the same orbit as the, as, as the thing does. Um, so yeah, I should have, should have noticed that at the beginning here. Um, let's see. Um, uh, yeah, okay. So, so there's a question from uh, Matoy here, uh, commenting that they saw a YouTube recently where he discussed um, uh, this, this uh, uh, thing that was mentioned a few weeks ago that a radio telescope had seen an unusual radio signal from Alpha Centauri, the nearest star other than the sun to us. Um, and uh, that this was a very unusual signal because it had a, a frequency of around 982 megahertz. Um, and uh, the, 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 um, what is this? What can cause something like this? You know, people have been doing a lot of searches for, okay, so there's this kind of, you know, big question, are we the only sort of intelligent things in the universe um, or are there other intelligences in the universe who might be doing things like what we're doing? And for example, sending radio signals out, uh, talking about all the wonderful things they're doing or showing their television programs or whatever else. How would we, how would we detect extraterrestrial intelligences? And uh, you know, how can we find signals of that? I think there's a, a pretty fundamental problem. W one of the big mysteries often called the Fermi paradox after a physicist named Enrico Fermi. Um, uh, the Fermi paradox is uh, how come we haven't already met all of the extra extraterrestrial intelligences? After all, if we've managed to get to the stage that we've managed to get to where we're just starting to send spacecraft a small distance out, chances are that in the history of the universe, we're not the first extraterrestrial, you know, the first intelligence. How come there aren't intelligences that developed a million years or a billion years earlier than us that have been sending spacecraft all over the, the, the universe, how come we haven't met any of those things? How come we still seem to be alone in the universe with respect to, to intelligence? I, I personally think that this is likely a sort of misunderstanding of how things work and the nature of intelligence and so on. I think the issue is that we might think, you know, we, we have to ask what is the sort of abstract definition of intelligence? And what we realized is that being able to do computation, being able to take an input and apply a sequence of rules to that input and figure out what the output should be, that's essentially what our computers are doing. It's what our brains are doing. When we take certain stimuli, you know, I read a question from, from here, then I, I sort of, things happen inside my brain and I start yakking and saying things. Um, that's, it's all sort of a computational process where in that case, the sort of the rules that govern the neurons in my brain and so on are, are activating in some way and, and producing an output. Um, this is, you know, these, these are all computational processes and we have to distinguish what's the difference between the sort of computational process that's happening in our brains that's causing us to say sensible or not sensible things 
versus the computational processes that are happening. I don't know when we see a, a you know some a waterfall and we see all of these complicated motions of water in the waterfall. What's the difference between the kinds of computations that are happening in our brains and in the water in the waterfall? Well. I used to think, oh, there's, there's a big difference between these things. There's something very special about the things that are happening in our brain. That's a sign of some kind of uh, you know, intelligence, whereas the waterfall is just doing what the waterfall does. But what I realized as a result of lots of science that I've done is that the level of sort of assessing these computations, there's really no difference in the sophistication of the computations that are going on in those two cases. They're really exactly equivalent. It's a thing I call the principle of computational equivalence. But the issue is the waterfall doesn't seem like it's, it's not human-like intelligence that it's showing. It's showing a computation that's as sophisticated as the computations going on in our brains, but it's not showing a computation that we recognize as being sort of purposeful in the same way that we imagine the computations going on in our brains are purposeful. So what we realize is in the universe, there's just tons of stuff that is doing sophisticated computation and that is in some abstract sense intelligent. There's extraterrestrial intelligence all over the place um, that is abstractly intelligent. The issue is, is it close enough in its details to human intelligence that we can kind of communicate with it and kind of understand and align our, our sense of purpose and our sense of how things work with the way that that intelligence works? And that's the real question. If we look at the, the sort of the space of possible intelligences, we say, here's human intelligence. Okay, you know, dolphin intelligence might be somewhere off here. Um, and here's, you know, and somewhere there's the abstract intelligence in the waterfall, and it's somewhere off, off in the distance there. So the question really is, how close is the, in the sort of space of possible intelligences, how close are other things that exist in the universe? Now it's a it's a sort of a bad sign that if it even takes you know we even consider the case of dolphins we don't have great sort of communication and understanding of dolphin intelligence and uh, we imagine that it's somehow inferior to human intelligence but maybe that's just uh, you know maybe we're just a million years too early maybe it's just that the dolphins have a very elaborate uh, uh, you know uh, elaborate kind of uh, civilization we just don't recognize it because it's a civilization that involves you know dolphins communicating by sending you know uh, vortices in the water by flipping their fins or something and we just have never never paid attention to that we don't really know um, and uh, we don't really understand how to decode the vocalizations of of uh, of those kinds of animals and so on so we really we don't know it's it's the same as the intelligence in the waterfall so to speak it's something that is that is that is happening and it's computationally sophisticated but we don't we can't sort of align it with the with the understanding that we have about how we think about things and so really the the challenge of extraterrestrial intelligence is are, is there are there intelligences close enough in intelligence space to us that we can actually sort of align with them to understand their purposes and to recognize them as being sort of human like intelligence so for the last about 50 years there have been attempts to kind of detect radio signals that are kind of potentially uh, things sent by sort of human-like extraterrestrial intelligence. Now, a thing to realize is, you know, if you're, uh, if you're trying to imagine what would be a form of communication, and by the way, even thinking about the notion of communication is kind of a very human in intelligence kind of notion. But if you imagine communication, you know, a, a, a common sort of science fiction-y type theory tends to be, oh, you know, there is a a giant galactic social network going on, but it's communicating using some mode of communication that maybe we are just not yet plugged into. Uh, so for example, you know, before 100 years ago, 130 years ago, uh, you know, nobody knew about radio. So if there'd been an elaborate, you know, if, if, the, um, uh, if uh, the, 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 the extraterrestrials, uh, the nearby stars were sending these, you know, elaborate radio communications to us. It's like, oh, there's just a dumb planet over there. They don't yet understand how to, how th th there's a thing radio. Well, it could be the case that, you know, maybe somebody is modulating gravitational waves and sending them to us. And we're just, uh, oh, that planet is too dumb to understand, you know, this elaborate signal sent in gravitational waves or in neutrinos or in some kind of uh, deformation of space-time that we don't yet understand or, or some such other thing. 
uh, and, and, and so, you know, maybe there's a, uh, maybe there's just a purely physical uh, means of communicating that is, um, uh, that, that we just don't know about. And that's the sort of key thing. And, and once we know it, oh, all those human-like extraterrestrial intelligences will sort of come into view. But the thing that we have known about radio communications on the earth is it was the case 50 years ago that the way people communicate with radio is to use a particular frequency of radio waves. You know, when you tune a radio receiver, you're tuning it. You know, a, a radio station might be, you know, um, I don't know, 926 megahertz or something, might be a, um, or whatever it is. You know, there might be a radio station that will quote its frequency. That's the main frequency of the radio signal that is coming from that radio station. And the way that the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the music you're hearing from the radio station or something is encoded is, well, a couple of different ways, but nowadays the most common is, is so-called frequency modulation, where basically that frequency, you think it's you know, 900 megahertz, for example, but actually it's 900 megahertz, 900.01 megahertz, for example, and that's the frequency right now, and then it's, point, uh, and then it's 900 plus 0.02 megahertz and so on. And those changes of frequency are decoded by the radio receiver to be changes of frequency of the sound that you're hearing. And so that would be, you know, as the, as the frequency maybe is further away from the, the nominal carrier frequency, the nominal frequency of that radio transmission, um, you're hearing a, a higher sound um, that, uh, that corresponds to. And if it's closer, maybe you're hearing a lower sound, the different ways to do that encoding. But basically you have this, this sort of main frequency you're, you're, you, you know, you've got one radio station at 900 megahertz, another radio station at 902 megahertz, let's say, and you're, you're tuning your radio receiver to mostly receive radio signals at that particular frequency. And then there's a small kind of modulation around that frequency that is the actual signal for the radio station that's actually giving you the, 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 that's decoded into the sound you hear and things like this. So 50 years ago, that's how everything worked. Actually, 50 years ago, it was mostly so-called amplitude modulation, um, where, where all you're doing is you, you have this fixed carrier. You're, you're sending out this kind of you know, long uh, uh, sort of beep from in, in radio, and you, you're just changing the intensity of that beep slightly, and that's the way that you're encoding the sound wave that you get to hear a sound. And, and then the amplitude modulation kind of gave way to frequency modulation as a slightly, slightly better method. Um, because uh, it's, it's better because, because with amplitude modulation, if, um, uh, if something changes, in the um, uh, if something changes in the way that the signal is being transmitted, that causes more of the signal to be attenuated, the signal to just get get smaller. You that would be translated into an actual change of the sound you get out, so to speak. Whereas with frequency modulation, it's looking for a change of frequency, which is not something that happens as naturally as a result of just sort of going through a a, a cloud or some other thing where the where the radio signal might be transmitted through. So in any case. You know, standard thing for us humans using radio is, you know, somebody gets the 900 megahertz slot, somebody else gets the 902 megahertz slot, somebody else gets the 908 megahertz slot, and so on. Every different radio station has a different slot, and you're sort of distinguishing these radio signals by the carrier frequencies that they use. And the way that one amplified radio signals was based on, on tuning a so-called resonant circuit to be tuned to that particular frequency and to where the excitations in the circuit would get bigger if they were, if they were excited just at that frequency. It's the same idea uh, roughly if you're on a swing and you're swinging back and forth and you, you know, I guess in American it's called pumping the swing. Um, you're, you're putting, you're sticking your legs out, you're pulling your legs in. And um, if you, you can get the swing to go up higher, if you, um, uh, if you, you know, stick your legs out when you go forwards, back when you go back, and so on, and you make the, the frequency with which you're, you're sticking your legs out, pulling your legs in, uh, correspond to the natural frequency of the swing. And that will, that is, is uh, an example of a kind of a resonant process where you're, where you're sort of increasing the amount you're swinging um, by doing that. And it's the same basic idea is used in, in the, the sort of basic amplifiers that are used for, for radio, depending on the, and it depends, 
you have to set the amplifier up to be tuned to a certain frequency. That's the sort of the, the, the traditional way to do this. Okay, so back 50 years ago, you sent a radio signal, you use a carrier frequency, you pick a particular frequency you're gonna do that at. So when people started looking for extraterrestrial intelligence, they said, let's look for carrier frequencies. Let's look for so-called narrow band signals where there's a particular frequency of radio that's being transmitted. And people built all kinds of devices to try and uh, uh, find, is there any narrow band signal? You know, even, even though there might be, uh, you know, we don't know whether they're going to pick this particular frequency or that particular frequency, but let's just look for anything where there's, a, where there's something where one's picked a particular frequency and then sent radio signals at that frequency. And I think um, uh, people would try to guess, oh, what frequency would they use? Well, I think there was one popular one, what was it, 1421 megahertz, I think, is, is a so-called the water hole frequency, which is a frequency where there are, uh, there are uh, when, when radio signals propagate through, through space, um, if there's any uh, gas molecules, for example, in the way, um, there are particular frequencies at which those gas molecules can be, uh, will absorb a lot more radio signals. They, they usually correspond to uh, excitations of the gas molecules, the gas molecules wiggling back and forth or rotating or whatever. At those particular frequencies, a lot of radio uh, uh, signals will be absorbed because the radio energy goes into sort of making the, the water molecules or whatever it is do what they do rather than, uh, and, and so they absorb the, the, the radio signal as it goes through. But there are particular frequencies at which, uh, for whatever reason, there aren't, uh, there don't happen to be uh, excitation frequencies for, for various things like water that are found as molecules in, in space. And there's one particular one, which was kind of this hole where there isn't absorption in space. And so that was sort of a guess that people had, I don't know, 50 years ago or so now for, oh, the extraterrestrials might use that fact that you can get radio signals through more easily at that frequency. Let's look specifically at that frequency. But then the general idea was, let's look at a particular frequency. Now, that idea is in some ways quite flawed because if you look at radio transmissions on the earth today, they are decreasingly specific to particular frequencies. They're much more often, uh, it's not the most efficient thing to do. You're putting a lot of energy into one frequency. It's more efficient to spread the spectrum, to use spread spectrum communication. As successive different generations of cell phone technology come in, they are more and more spread spectrum, 5G is even more so than 4G, for example. Um, and you, you stop having this kind of sharp peak of a particular frequency. And, and, and in fact, even beyond that, the very idea of a broadcast way of sending a radio signal where you say, I've got this radio antenna and it's broadcasting in all directions, this, this radio signal, that's kind of old news because if you do that, your radio signal is like going in all directions. And if you are trying to send that signal to a particular receiver, most of the energy that you're spending is being spent sending the signal in all directions that are irrelevant to sending the signal to that particular receiver. So for example, in 5G to, uh, cell phones, there's, a, there's an effort to have uh, uh, a, a way of directing the signal. So it's essentially, instead of just going in all directions, the antenna is set up as a so-called phased array, which sets it up so that, uh, that, that it will tend to, to direct the, the radio uh, instead of going in all directions to make the radio go in a specific direction. And you can do that with other kinds of radio antennas like parabolic antennas, things like that. Um, also have this feature that they tend to direct radio signals in a particular direction. Um, so increasingly with communications on earth, we're trying to just say, oh, there's a sender, there's a receiver. Let's pick who wants to receive it. Let's just send to the receiver. Sometimes like for radio navigation beacons, you, it's more convenient to just say, oh, there's this broadcast thing. It's going in all directions. Anybody can sort of passively listen to it without registering, I'm the receiver, send the signal in my direction. But anyway, so, so if we're even looking for sort of the future of our civilization, um, I don't think the amount of sort of radio energy that is going to be just sort of going off into space, sending it out as a, as a giant radio transmission that can be picked up anywhere in the galaxy type thing, I think we'll, we'll be doing that to a decreasing extent, except insofar as we're specifically sending signals for the purpose of saying, hi, we're here. Um, and there's been a lot of debate about whether we as a species 
should be sending signals into space saying, hi, we're here. Um, people, you know, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a, a funny sort of question of, uh, you know, if we're doing that, it's like one thing we're saying is, oh, you know, hi, we're here. Look at us. We're, we're so magnificent. We've discovered all these interesting things. Another view would be, uh, you know, look at us and somebody will come and say, uh, you know, if there's extraterrestrials that are, that are like, you know, humans in history, so to speak, let's just go take over that planet. You know, more territory, better. Uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a sort of projection from human behavior and human history that you might think that the extraterrestrials would be like, you know, oh, we're going to go conquer the galaxy type thing. And so by sending the signal saying, hi, we're here, it's, it's kind of an invitation to come and, come, and, uh, uh, come and take over our planet, which would be uh, presumably a really bad thing. Um, so, so there's a lot of debate on whether signals should be sent, and, and some signals have been sent. Um, but the question is, well, maybe the extraterrestrials are sending signals. Maybe there are, uh, maybe there are signals that are just radio navigation beacons from, from random extraterrestrials that we could pick up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think this is a somewhat flawed concept because I think this kind of distance and intelligence space is a thing to think about. And my guess is that there's plenty of intelligence in the, in the galaxy, in the universe. It just isn't really well aligned with human intelligence. And even in the future of our our civilization is, is probably not going to be very aligned with the present of our civilization and, and the kinds of, uh, you know, our ability to recognize, oh, yeah, that really is a purposeful activity, um, you know, across history has even been quite poor, even, even across a few thousand years, let alone across hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years. But anyway, uh, you know, people still look for the do SETI, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and uh, they look for, for signals. Um, that might be signs of kind of human-like intelligence and narrowband signals is the, is the number one thing people look for. In fact, it's not clear people are really looking for anything else. Nobody really knows any other good things to look for. And um, so every so often somebody will discover, oh, whoops, there's, you know, there's, there's some signal like this. And one was discovered, I think in September of last year, um, uh, near Alpha Centauri, uh, coming apparently from the direction of Alpha Centauri, a, a signal at a particular frequency. And it's like, wow, what can cause that? Well, you know, one thing that can cause that is a, is a human-like alien with a radio set, you know, with a radio antenna sending it. But there are probably a lot of things in physics that can also cause that. The most common thing that will cause narrowband um, uh, emissions, well, okay, so there are, um, uh, the, the, there are, uh, Okay, there are spectral lines. There are things called masers. Um, the um, uh, bas basically uh, specific kinds of atoms will tend to have a characteristic frequency at which they emit uh, light or radio signals. It's the same thing, you know, if you have a um, uh, something like a neon, you know, a neon sign. That's that's the um, uh, the neon atoms inside that tube are being excited and they are emitting light at a particular reddish frequency. Um, and that, and for different kinds of atoms, there'll be different characteristic frequencies. You can get intense emission in a maser, which is a microwave analog of a laser. A laser is, is amplifying light um, and it amplifies light at a particular frequency um, that will depend on what medium and what the, what the material inside the laser is. Um, similarly, there's a microwave version of that where you're amplifying radio signals, and that's another way you can get sort of an intense, um, uh, intense radio signal. And there are there are naturally occurring masers um, that exist in in uh, uh, in the galaxy, so to speak. And that's a that's a common source for a narrowband signal. And, and then there are other things that happen, like for example, you could end up with a signal which seemed to be narrowband just because of the way you detected it, but actually it only lasted for a microsecond, and it was just a random thing that you couldn't tell was, was not typical of, you know, it's like if you toss a coin and you say, you know, you say, uh, like, I'm a real winner. I got heads, 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 heads 10 times in a row. Um, you know, it's like, is that, uh, you know, getting heads 10 times in a row, is that just chance? And uh, if you look over a long, long enough period of time, you'll get an equal number of heads and tails. Or is it a lucky coin or an unlucky coin or whatever? Or, or do you have some special, uh, you know, some special touch that's making it always come up heads every time? Um, the, uh, you know, that, that's a thing where you have to use statistics to try to figure out 
is what you're seeing characteristic of the average or is it something special? So I don't know more specifics of this particular, uh, uh, th this particular observation. I probably should, should, uh, should learn more about that. Let's see, there's a question here. Uh, it was a quite different kind of question about APIs. Um, and uh, gosh, I don't from Taylor here. Not quite sure I understand the details of this, but but let me let me just say a little bit about APIs, what APIs are, people who might have heard of them or not heard of them. So when we use computers, it's we're humans, we're communicating with a computer somehow. We are like typing something into the computer. We're pressing the computer screen. It's an interface between us humans and the computer. And so, for example, we might have a graphical user interface where we're like pressing things that are graphically showing up on the screen. We might have a command line interface where we're typing commands into the computer, uh, just you know, type, 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 do something, telling the computer what to do and so on. But these are interfaces between humans and the computer. But it's often the case in kind of the infrastructure of the world in addition to humans communicating with computers, there are lots and lots of computers that need to communicate with computers. And so there might be a computer that, um, oh, for example, is uh, uh, doing, um, what would be a good example? Oh, I don't know, it's a, um, uh, let's say a computer that is doing a financial transaction where it's told, you know, every week somebody said, transfer this money to this account. Okay. So then there's a computer that has a task that's running on it that says, that wakes up every week and says, okay, now I'm going to transfer this money. Okay. What is it going to do? Well, what it has to do is it has to tell another computer to go do that money transfer. The question is, how does it communicate with that other computer? You know, does it use the graphical user interface of the other computer? Does it use a command line interface? No, it doesn't do either of those things. It uses what's called an API, an application program interface, which is a way in which uh, programs expose an interface for computers to use the program or for other programs to use the program. And so what do, what do, what do APIs look like? Um, it, it depends, uh, there are a lot of different details about how these work. The most common kind of API in modern times is a web API. And um, uh, in a, um, so when you go to a website, you type in the URL for the website. And the thing you get is, you know, you might type in, I don't know, wolfram.com. And what you will get back is you, you'll type that into your web browser. And what the web, the server, the computer that we have at, you know, wolfram.com is sending back a big bunch of HTML code that gets sent back to your browser program and your browser program then displays it as a beautiful website. But, uh, and so that's, that's using, that's a web address that you give in the, in the uh, you know, URL bar of the browser. Okay, there are also, you can also have a web API. It's also a URL but it's a URL that instead of sending back typically HTML intended for human consumption, it might send back all kinds of random data that is not intended for human consumption, it's intended for consumption by a program. And so that would be kind of an API, where a web API, where you're using the web to communicate the information, uh, you're still using the HTTP protocol that appears at the beginning of the, the, the full form of the URL. You're still using that protocol. You're still, but, but instead of it being something where you're sending the data back to a browser for, to be displayed by a human, uh, to be displayed for a human, it might be instead of, the, instead of you as a human typing that URL in, a program might be generating that URL and then sending uh, a message to the web server through HTTP and then the web server is sending back this blob of information that comes back not to a browser, but to another kind of program. So if you go to a, a web API in a browser, you can go there and instead of getting back a uh, nice, beautiful HTML, you might get back some blob of, of for example, JSON, which is a, a, um, a, a textually readable output. You might get back some you know, a piece of symbolic Wolfram language code. You might get back a binary pile of gunk. 
that uh, was intended for, for, communi for, for communication to a particular kind of program. But the point is you're getting back something that wasn't really intended for you as a human. It was intended for a program to, to receive it. So there are these um, APIs that are things where, uh, and, oh, and typically the other thing to say about a web API is when you go to a website, many websites are static websites in the sense that the, you, you go to that URL, wolfram.com, for example, and it's just like everybody who goes to that URL gets the same results back, gets the same nice website coming back. Okay, in a, in a web, uh, in a URL, there can be a question mark in the URL, and then there are various things that you can give, blah equals blah, blah equals blah, and so on. After that question mark, those are a typical way to specify parameters for uh, that can be used in an API when you're when you're treating that URL as something that's specifying that, that that's that's uh, when you're using it uh, to communicate with an API. Those parameters after the question mark are the sort of the things you feed into the API. Now, in, in Wolfram language, for example, it's extremely easy to create a web API. You basically just say uh, to make a public one. You just say cloud publish API function, and then you give a piece of code in there. And what that will do is it will set up a, a URL. It will tell you the URL it's setting up. Uh, that will be a URL that, that is, is, uh, exists on our servers, on our cloud server, um, at least in the default way you do it. It exists on our cloud server. And then anybody who goes to that cloud server with the appropriate parameters after the question mark in the URL will basically be running the piece of code you specified in that API function, and then you'll get back the results for that, and you'll get those back. I mean, you, you might happen to set it up so that the results that come back are HTML, so they're displayable as, as sort of visual stuff in a browser, but more likely you'd set it up as something which will be consumed by a program so that it isn't, it isn't intended for human, uh, uh, you know, human reading, it's intended for program consumption. And, and that's, that's the more common case. Now, now, you know, in addition to web APIs, so, so often wrapped around a web API might be uh, some kind of programming language that is uh, making the call to the web API. So for example, you could have a Wolfram language program that uses uh, URL read to read for URL execute actually would be better to execute a web API. That, the, the, that URL execute uh, command in Wolfram language would go and, um, uh, and and um, uh, and and make that web request and get the result back and 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 then make it uh, use it within the Wolfram language program. Do the same thing from any programming language, you know, Java, Python, whatever else. Um, they all have capabilities for for calling web APIs. So that's the most common sort of form of API. But there are different protocols for APIs. So you don't have to be sort of a fake web browser to to use an API. There are other types of APIs that um, don't necessarily even go through the web at all. They're just APIs that can exist either between computers or on a single computer. You could have a, uh, something on a single computer where you're running a program and it has a way that other programs can communicate with it. And you would commonly say it has a certain API. And so the, the, the way that's used in sort of modern software engineering, uh, it's like a program has all kinds of things that are going on inside it and it exposes certain APIs. It exposes certain things. You can poke it in certain ways. You can say, do an X, do a Y, do a Z, and then it will respond. And that, that, that sort of way of poking it, that X, Y, or Z, or whatever, those are features of its API, so to speak. So sometimes people who are used to software engineering will generalize that a bit. And they'll say, you know, if you're thinking about biology, for example, and you're thinking about some type of cell, you know, you could say, well, the cell has certain things it exposes on the cell surface. It has certain, a certain sort of API to the rest of the, uh, of the human body or something. That's what it exposes. And there are all kinds of things going on inside the cell, but it's exposing a certain sort of API to the outside world. That's kind of a generalization, a sort of software engineering uh, metaphor for what happens in other places. But in, in, a, in, a, um, uh, in, a, in a computer setting, it's, you know, the API is the program to program interface. There's another, um, well, it's, it's uh, yeah, so the, the, there are a few other kinds of things. There's another notion, uh, an FFI, foreign function interface. Um, uh, APIs usually, 
Well, okay, so, so APIs usually have a comparatively simple structure. They're like, there's a particular command, there's a particular service provided by the API. It's like, do this, here's the parameters for that service and come back with the results. When things get more complicated, it isn't really feasible to encode things in the form of uh, you know, a key of value, a key of value. Um, it gets more complicated. That's where computational language design that I spend my time doing really comes in. When you want to specify a more sophisticated kind of uh, way to define what you want to do, you have to give this sort of whole language structure and, and that requires a, a sort of a more elaborate way to communicate program to program. So for example, we built a thing uh, used to be called MathLink. It's now called WSTP, or from Symbolic Transfer Protocol. Uh, we actually built this in 1989, a really, long, really long time ago. It's a way of communicating sort of arbitrary computational actions between programs. So instead of just saying, "Oh, uh, you know, here's this one parameter that I want to give to specify what this other program should do," you can say, "Here is this symbolic representation of a computational action." Um, that can be generated by one program, sent to another program, then the other program can execute that computational action and give the result back. And so that's a, a more sophisticated kind of API that would, instead of using HTTP, um, to, where you're just sending these sort of strings of bytes in, in, uh, encoded uh, for, a, for a web system, uh, it's, you're using WSTP colon, and that is a, uh, then you're using this, this different kind of protocol that allows you to send these arbitrary symbolic expressions representing kind of arbitrary computational actions. So that's a, that's a rough introduction to APIs. And, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the world of the future where, where there are lots of AIs running around, you know, do the artificial intelligences kind of turn, the, turn their communications into something that's kind of human level understandable? Or do they all have APIs where they're communicating in a form that's sort of computer to computer and understandable to computers, but not necessarily understandable to us? Uh, that's sort of a challenge for the future. Well, let's see. Um, so there's a question here. Um, okay, there's a question from Colin about if the average human brain was represented as a PC, what would its technical specifications be? Its core count, its clock speed, its RAM, its storage space, etc. Interesting question. Well, we know a certain amount about the brain. The brain seems to have about 100 billion neurons. The human brain has about 100 billion neurons, and it has about... Um, maybe 100 trillion total connections between those neurons. And each connection, uh, each synapse that is a connection between neurons is um, uh, perhaps stores, I don't know, maybe a thousand bits of information, maybe roughly. So, uh, and, and the neurons in our brains are all sort of operating in parallel they're all, you know, neurons on one side of the brain are firing at the same time as another side of the brain and so on. And, but they do it comparatively slowly on a time scale of all of milliseconds, thousandths of a second. Um, on the other hand, when we think about a particular thing, there's some evidence that, that sort of the thoughts are somehow localized. So we're not really using all of the neurons firing in other parts of the brain. We might be using them for our vision system. You know, the primary visual cortex to the back of one's head is... Um, is sort of, you know, all those neurons are firing and, and processing, you know, the pixel from this position, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, when we're sort of thinking a concentrated thought, it's not clear how broadly that spreads in the brain and, and to what extent it's localized. Um, but, uh, but, but so let, let's assume that, let's just for the sake of argument, assume that the whole brain is sort of active all the time. Let's say it has a cycle time of a millisecond, which is very slow compared to a computer. I mean, a modern computer will typically have uh, the, the clock frequency of a modern computer might be two gigahertz or five gigahertz. So that's five, five billion cycles per second, as opposed to on the order of a thousand cycles per second. So we're kind of, we're kind of losing. So it would be a one kilohertz computer that we have, but it would be one kilohertz computer that in effect has uh, something more like, you know, a hundred billion cores all operating at, at that fairly low speed, but each core has, let's say, 
assuming it's connected um, to, uh, uh, let's see, um, a thousand. Okay, so let's say each core would have maybe a hundred thousand bits associated with it of, of memory, which is tiny. I mean, that's that's some, um, you know, that's ten kilobytes of memory basically. Um, so so in those in those terms, what we would be saying is, uh, let's see, it's um, ten kilobytes, ten to the five bytes um, times. Uh, well, let's say it's a uh, that's 10 to the 17, um, uh, so that would be um, um, trillion. So that's a that's that's almost a million trillion bits, or almost a million. Uh, so let's say uh, let's knock it down a bit. So I think that will be about um, uh, uh, 10,000 terabytes or 10 petabytes of, um, of information will be roughly the storage capacity uh, with assuming that, that things are stored that way. Now, the way that we store things in the brain, we have no idea the details of how that storage works and how redundant it is, how many bits we use. You know, in a computer, we might just have a, you know, when we store a number in a computer, it might just be this one copy of the number. But in our brains, there might effectively be lots of different versions of that number scattered all over the place. But, but in round numbers, maybe 10 petabytes of, of, um, uh, of information might be a guess. Um, and then we can ask the question, um, uh, but we're, we're processing that at um, uh, the, the aggregate processing speed, if we sort of combine all our cores together, if they were all working in parallel, um, might be on the order of, let's see, that's um, uh, 10 gigahertz times, um, so that would be on the order of a terahertz if everything was sort of working in parallel, which it undoubtedly isn't. So it's undoubtedly much slower than that. And then, so we can ask questions like, um, as we experience the world, um, how much data are we ingesting? How much data do we, you know, how much, how much do we see in our lifetime? You know, we might have, um, you know, as, as we look around, we might see a different scene in our eyes moving these sick ads. Um, but if we ignore that and we just say how many different scenes, let's say we see a different scene. Let's just say we see a different scene every uh, few times a minute. Okay. And um, uh, let, let's say we see a different scene every 10 seconds. Okay, so in our first, so every year, uh, assuming, so we, let, let, there are 30 million seconds in a year. And so let's knock it down a bit for, you know, being asleep and this and that and the other. So let's say it's 20 million seconds that are relevant. And let's say every 10 seconds, we see something different. So that's uh, 2 million different things we see per year. And our eyes are roughly like 10 megapixel cameras. Um, so they, our eyes uh, see about, uh, 10 million pixels in one kind of one, one, uh, uh, and they see it, um, the, 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 well, our eyes have a persistence time of order one fifteenth of a second. So every 10 times a second, roughly, we can sort of see a different image on our eyes, but that's not in practice what we're saying. We're saying like every 10 seconds or something, we might see something different. So we're saying 2 million of those per year and our eyes are, are ingesting, let's say, if we looked at every single pixel, it might be 10 megapixels. So that's um, uh, um, 20 times um, 20 trillion. Um, that would be uh, uh, 20, roughly, let's say, uh, 20 trillion, um, 20 tera, let, let's say, uh, you know, on the, a few terabytes per year of um, uh, you know the movie that we see per year might you know of really different scenes might be of order twenty terabytes or, or some number of terabytes. The movie, the the sort of maximum speed movie where every frame is different, might be more in the petabyte range. But so so what we're seeing is that the the total information that we can see from our eyes is is of the order of of um, uh, you know in a, in a in a in a in a lifetime might be getting up to the, um, uh, the, the tens to hundreds of terabytes. So we kind of still have, we, you know, if we're efficient in storing that, we'd kind of have enough storage in our brains to store all of that. Uh, the fact is we certainly don't recognize, we certainly don't notice every single pixel and every scene we're seeing. We probably extract a very small amount of sort of summary information from every scene we see. So it's a lot easier to fit that information into a brain. So, so that uh, you know, we we can we can store those kinds of images. If we think about you know how many words have we heard 
um, you know, we might, um, uh, we might, let's see if we, um, uh, well, let's, let's work it out. If we, if we, um, uh, I think it's silent reading is like 200 words per minute. So that means if we are, uh, if we're like reading, reading, reading all the time, um, let, let's say we read, um, uh, let's see, 200 words per minute is um, uh, every second we're, we're reading um, on the order of, uh, well, let's say three words per second. Um, so that means um, uh, we are, um, uh, let's see, so that would mean if we were reading for 10 million seconds a, a year, which means we're reading one third of the time, so 10 million seconds a year times um, um, three words per second would be, would be 30 million words per, per year um, that we will be reading and sort of silent reading. And uh, how big is 30 million words per year? That's, um, uh, uh, let's see, a, a, um, a, a, a typical book. Well, let's work out that out. I mean, a typical book might have, I don't know, maybe 40 characters per line, maybe, um, maybe a little less than that, depends on the width of the book. Uh, maybe 30 characters per line and maybe 50 characters per page, or 50 lines per page. So that would be, um, uh, am I getting this right? 100, um, uh, 1,500 characters per page. So that means times, let's say, um, uh, 1,500 characters per page um, would be, um, uh, boy, I was never very good at mental arithmetic. So I, hopefully many people out there can do this much faster than I can. Um, so that's um, 1.5 times 10 to the 3 times, let's say, um, uh, 1.5 times 10 to the 5. Um, so that's uh, um, 150,000 characters per book, let's say. So let's say, let's say 100,000 characters per book. Um, and so this, uh, the, the thing we just estimated of reading 10 million uh, characters, or maybe we said 30 million characters per year, um, would be, uh, let's say it's 10 million characters per year, that's 10 to the seven divided by, uh, that's not very many, that's, uh, that's surprisingly few. That would be, um, uh, well, with that estimate, we'd be saying you would read, um, at that speed, you would read 100 books per year, which seems, which seems low. I think we're, we're probably, if we put in a few more of those factors, we're probably a little bit more accurate. It's more like a few hundred books per year. Um, so it gives you, gives you a little bit of a sense of scale there. Um, well, so that, that's some um, uh, rough estimates, but brains, brains probably, we, we already know from the operation of artificial neural nets that brains probably work in rather different ways from the ways that we're used to having computers work. All right, maybe one more question here. Um, let's see. Question from Mikhail, why is it difficult for our brains to perform many simple calculations in a row? Hmm, interesting question. I mean, I think that uh, doing things like math and logic and so on, these sort of abstract fields are not very natural for brains. They're also not very natural for artificial neural networks. I mean, I think one of the challenges, I mean, some people are much better than others. Like I was just exercising my mental arithmetic abilities um, such as they are, and I think um, uh, it's um, uh, you know you you doing simple op operations that are defined in a simple symbolic way in terms of numbers or logic or whatever, just not a very good match for brains. Brains can take a picture and say, well, they're roughly these features and those features, and this is roughly how we'll represent that picture. Um, but that's a very different thing from saying it's precisely the number seven. It's precisely this logic, you know, true or false logic thing. And brains just aren't very good at that. And probably we store those things by kind of saying, oh, it's kind of like a, a picture where it's all blue versus all red. And that's a totally inefficient way to think about storing these things, which for purposes of our sort of abstract computation or our actual digital computers are really efficient and easy to deal with. Okay, well, uh, I think we should probably um, uh, wrap up for now here, if there's something else I can do quickly. Oh, there's a reasonably quick one here. 
from Parmenides, is the eightfold way of Murray Gell-Mann easier or more difficult than learning quantum chromodynamics? It's kind of easier. I mean, it was named the eightfold way after, after the Buddha thing, but it has nothing to do with the Buddha. It has to do with um, uh, just a, 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 the, the, it's, it's the fact that particles like protons, pions, neutrons, whatever, are made of quarks. And um, the, the eightfold way, Murray's kind of cutesy eightfold way idea is, it turns out there, are, if you have three kinds of quarks, up, down, and strange, for example, and you combine those three together in three different, uh, in, you, you have particles that are made from three quarks at a time. So you might have an up, up, up particle, you might have an up, up, down, up, down, strange, up, strange, strange, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It turns out for the, the sort of the, the most common kinds of particles, there are exactly eight ways to make those combinations and they correspond to eight common kinds of particles. Uh, well, uh, protons and neutrons, the sigma hyperons, the lambda hyperon, and the psi cascade hyperons. These are the different kinds of baryons. They were all discovered in the 1950s and uh, um, that um, um, are made of three quarks. And it so happens that the mesons that are things like the pion, which is responsible for holding nuclei together, um, it so happens those are made of quark antiquark pairs. It so happens that because of the details of the, um, uh, of the way that combinations of, of, um, of objects work, um, that you have um, that they're the same number that the, the three pions, the kaons, uh, the, um, uh, oh yeah, the anti-kaons, yeah, they're also in the same multiplex and the, and the eta particle are all, um, uh, uh, all from, uh, there are eight of those and they come from the quark anti-quark uh, uh, combination. So, so it's kind of a, uh, but, but in the more fancy mathematics, um, and the way this was originally discovered was by using group theory, theory of continuous groups, so-called Lie groups, kind of the, the, the analog of calculus for group theory. Um, and those are parts of the irreducible representations, the irreducible representations of the group SU3. Um, and that's the story of how one understands, but you can understand the eightfold way just in terms of counting quarks. You don't have to go fancy group theory and you don't have to start talking about uh, matrices representing, uh, corresponding to the representations of groups and so on. QCD, the theory of quarks and gluons is a more elaborate theory where, the, where now the, the SU3 symmetry is a symmetry of color, uh, notionally color, it's not really color, it's, a, it's a, an internal feature of quarks and gluons. That's a different thing from the, are you an up quark, a down quark, a strange quark, that's so-called flavor uh, symmetry. Uh, color symmetry is a sort of internal parameter of quarks and gluons. And the way that that, um, uh, that, that theory is considerably more elaborate um, and involves sort of a, a good mathematical theory, understanding of that theory involves thinking about fiber bundles and connections on fiber bundles and all kinds of more, more elaborate sorts of things. So I should wrap up there. Um, I think we're going to um, uh, uh, probably uh, think about some potential themes for these, um, uh, uh, these live streams. Uh, as I say, we're doing business and innovation and history and, uh, of science and technology in alternating weeks on a different day. I think for uh, this live stream, which I really had hoped to be at least at a level that was accessible to, uh, uh, to kids and so on, um, we, might, uh, we might try and start picking some, some specific themes if people have suggestions, please uh, feel free to send them in um, and uh, see where we go with that. All right, well, thanks for joining us and uh, see you another time.